Good morning. Um, welcome to this, the second day of our conference on competition, big data, and fundamental rights. Um, so this morning, we will hear from several people. Uh, and I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Alessandro Mantelero from the University of Turin, who will talk about AI, big data, and fundamental rights towards a broader impact assessment of data processing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here today with you. And um, I'm Professor Private Law at Polytechnical University of Turin, and I also rapporteur uh, for the Council of Europe on data protection and artificial intelligence. And for this reason, uh, today I also focus on uh, the work that uh, we are carrying out uh, at the level of Council of Europe uh, that uh, at the end of this year we'll adopt uh, a specific uh, set of guidelines on data protection and artificial intelligence based on a report that will be adopted uh, in December in the next plenary section. So today we focus on artificial intelligence, big data and fundamental rights because uh, from my perspective it's very important to consider not only data protection issues but having a broader approach that take into account also other kind of uh, rights and fundamental rights that are uh, frequently uh, affected by potential use of data intensive uh, solution and application. So we start with uh, three different cases. The first case on, on the right is represented by uh, IBM uh, Watson case. In IBM case, uh, Watson was uh, uh, used by uh, doctors in order to provide suggestion uh, to uh, treat patients. Uh, but uh, what happened? It happened that uh, in many cases, uh, doctors in the hospital realized that the suggestions coming from Watson were not so good and were not consistent with their practice. Um, the second case is represented by uh, the use of uh, algorithms in order to select people to provide them loan and services and so on. And again, also in this case, there was a small problem because there was a discrimination an indirect discrimination and not intentional discrimination against uh, some categories of people and uh, minorities. And the last case is uh, the Amazon case in which Amazon uh, collected uh, a large number of curriculum vitae and uh, selected the CV on the basis on the historical track of the people that were uh, recruited in this company. And again, there was a bias in favor of male candidate and against the female candidate. Uh, what is the reason of this different case? And we can also add a, a further one that is represent is not in, in, the, in the picture, is represented by the case of uh, a company, um, an insurance company uh, that uh, collect a, a lot of information uh, based on a sort of sensor that was on, on the car and was able to detect uh, the manner in which you use the car. And uh, in doing that, uh, um, adopt a sort of uh, variable uh, cost of the insurance based on the uh, manner in which you use the car. And uh, one of the parameters that was used uh, for this purpose was based on the fact that uh, uh, if you use the car during the night uh, between the 2 and the 6 p.m. a.m., sorry, uh, you were considered um, exposed to a higher risk because it was supposed that you came back from a party and so you uh, drank a lot and there was some risk in terms of accidents. But they did not realize that <laughs> there were also people that at that time go to work and not come back from a party. And so there was an adverse discrimination in U.S. against people coming from uh, the small uh, suburbs, uh, many cases uh, low class in terms of economical uh, status and uh, in many cases also part of minority groups. And so wh what is the issues in all these different cases? The issue is based on the fact that we use that intensive systems but in many cases we don't care too much about uh, the potential impact of this system in terms of uh, um, negative adverse impact on uh, rights uh, 
uh, rights in terms of rights of movement, uh, rights in terms of uh, non-discrimination uh, and uh, access to works, access to education and so on. So there are a different range of interests that are potentially affected by this kind of application if they are not uh, used in a careful manner. And the reason is due to the, the different uh, um, uh, reason that they are mentioned in the in this case, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the first case uh, and the case of the the, the doctor, and uh, the the problem is that uh, the data that you use uh, for the training phase of this algorithm are very specific data set. In that case, where the data set of a specific hospital, and as a consequence, the algorithms learn from this practice and adopt the practice of this hospital. But of course, other hospitals have a different kind of approach and consider this practice that they were not in line with their own approach. Uh, in the second case, in the, in the case of discrimination, again, there was not an intentional discrimination, but there were some variables that were indirect uh, element that can uh, give a negative uh, um, um, evaluation with regard to some specific categories. In this sense, the algorithm was not created in order to discriminate, but there were some variables using the, to create the algorithm that uh, were not checked in terms of potential discrimination. And uh, it's the same of the last case in which we have a sort of historical data set and what is called traditional uh, historical bias. Historical bias is, is uh, the situation in which you use a data set that has a very historical uh, um, origin and uh, as a consequence uh, you create a sort of uh, fulfilling bias. So if you recruit a lot of people that are white uh, and uh, are uh, coming from a specific country, as a consequence, you continue to recruit uh, this kind of people. So this is the challenges that we want to address uh, in, uh, in the future, and we have to address in order to have uh, not a negative impact of this technology on uh, uh, fundamental rights. And which tools we have from a legal perspective? Uh, one tool that we have in, in our hand is represented by the GDPR and uh, more in general by data protection regulation. Uh, why this kind of focus on data protection regulation? Because of course the, f the, the central point of this regulation is represented by data. And uh, in uh, algorithm we use data. And so uh, for this reason are the, the, the kind of uh, regulation that uh, can be most useful in order to uh, address this kind of challenges. Of course, as I mentioned in the, in the next uh, uh, slides, uh, this is not the entire picture because the main problem and the limitation of the GDPR and the other data protection regulation is due to the fact that they are focused on data protection, mainly on data protection. So uh, in this sense, uh, there are different myths that uh, are relevant uh, from this perspective. The first one is the myth of consent or broadly self-determination with regard to data use. So the idea that individuals are able to understand, are able to take a decision, and are able to express a meaningful consent or, or other forms that give a sense of self-determination with regard to uh, the use of data. The main problem in this uh, context is that uh, people don't care, don't know, and are not able to understand. They don't care because in many cases when you use a smartphone, you don't care about the fact that uh, when you download an app, uh, you also download a lot of services that monitor your behavior and predict something about you. Uh, don't know because in many people don't know that when there is a webcam around uh, in the cities, this webcam can be used uh, for many different uh, purposes, not necessary to uh, control uh, uh, crime events, but only to predict movement, etc., etc. And don't understand because if uh, you have time to spend uh, to read uh, the notice of an app or something more, and uh, only the two percent of people do that. <laughs> and if you are a lawyer, you are already in a, you are in a good position because you are able to understand part of the language. But there is a lot of part of the language that comes from computer science that you are not able to understand. If you are computer science, you don't understand the legal stuff. And if you understand all this, at the end the problem is that you don't know what is behind. You don't know the algorithm, you don't know the variable that are used in this algorithm, you don't know the data set that they were used to train the algorithm. So at the end you are not able to assess 
the quality of the data use and the potential impact of data use. If you remember the famous case ProPublica uh, that investigates a case of uh, Compass uh, uh, software use in the court in the US uh, uh, to assess the risk of recidivism in, uh, in criminal law. Uh, the Compass case was possible because uh, the ProPublica invests time, money and resources in order to detect uh, this bias that uh, affected this algorithm. But we cannot imagine that there is a ProPublica behind every corner in the city able to have time and resources to investigate each kind of algorithm that we use. Also because algorithms is bec are becoming cheaper and cheaper and so <laughs> are embedded in many different kinds of applications. So it's very difficult to do that. So for this reason, the idea of consent, of self-determination, and also the individual dimension of data protection represent a critical problem. Because uh, right now, when we talk about uh, big data and artificial intelligence, the focus is no longer on the person or on the individual. Okay, there is the profiling aspects, but it's not the main aspect. The main aspect is classifying people, is creating groups, uh, and uh, treating groups in a different manner. So what is important is classify you as a member of a specific group and move you from a group to another on the base on your behavior. But the algorithm and the entity that use algorithm don't care about the fact that you are John Smith or another person. They are only interested in the fact that you are an, an entity with uh, some specific uh, qualities and, uh, classi and uh, these qualities make uh, possible to classify you in a specific group. So this is, a, from a legal perspective, is also a problem in terms of the application of data protection in, uh, in this field. The second myth is the fact that uh, According to GDPR and the other data protection laws, uh, the focus is uh, on the purpose. And the purpose limitation principle says that the principles are known at the moment of the data in which the data are collected. But as you know, when you use big data and also when you use uh, some application of machine learning, you don't know the purpose. The purpose is collecting a lot of data for a very general purpose. If you read the GDPR, there is a, a point in the, in the introduction uh, in, in which uh, uh, also the GDPR admit that, for instance, in in research sector, it's possible to have a, a general purpose and adopt an approach that is traditionally called as broad consent. So you agree with a very general purpose. But of course, this is uh, in the GDPR is only in uh, in the introductory part, and uh, is only for a specific uh, sector of research. But now is the typical manner in which are used data. Data scientists collect a large amount of data, use tools to analyze this data, extract correlation, and then on the basis of this correlation realize which data are useful for which purpose. So this is quite different with the system that we had in mind in the GDPR. And this is normal because the GDPR is grounded on the directive. And the directive was born at the end of the 80s, early 90s, in which the system in data processing was completely different. It was a statistical system based on sampling. And sampling is based on the idea that when you create a sample, you know the purpose. So it was consistent at that time. Right now, it's no longer consistent. The middle of minimization, of course, if you <laughs> talk about big data, is not so easy to have a minimization. It's possible, but it's not so easy. And the risk assessment. The risk assessment is a traditional point of uh, um, data protection law, but uh, is, uh, there is an emphasis on risk assessment uh, in uh, the GDPR. Uh, there is a small problem. The small problem is represented by the fact that uh, we have not a lot of experience in risk assessment. Of course, there are data protection impact assessment tools that were adopted in the past, privacy impact assessment called uh, from uh, Australia, UK, and uh, many other countries. Data protection impact assessment in Europe, for instance, the CNIL model, the, the UK data protection information commission authority model, and so on. But many of them are based on two main pillars, data quality and data security. There is not a lot of room for the impact on society, the impact on fundamental rights, and the main focus represented by the quality of data and the data security. So the suggestion is to try to find a certain manner to go on behind the GDPR, to 
try to figure out a new solution that are not necessary regulatory solution. Because of course, we spend a lot of time to create a GDPR. We cannot imagine to have a new GDPR in a few years. And it was uh, a nightmare for many people. <laughs> so uh, the idea is that there are other tools, and there are soft law. There is room also in the GDPR for code of conduct uh, or practice and so on. But tools that are also more flexible to deal with the challenges represented by the new forms of data intensive application. And in this sense, I think to start a discussion on this different scenario, future scenario, we have to take into account some points. The first point is what I mentioned before, the categorical approach of these tools and the predictive nature of these tools. The second point is that uh, the profiling is no longer at an individual level, but is at group level. So we have to consider this collective privacy. Collective privacy is also a challenge from a legal perspective, because from a legal perspective, collective rights in the field of human rights are not so accepted. There are collective remedies in many cases, but there are not collective rights in this sense. Although, for instance, in the field of uh, um, environment law, there is a, 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 an experience, a long experience in terms of collective interest in environment. And so uh, this suggests us also to, as a lawyer, as a law scholars, to reconsider the categories. I know that it's very difficult for lawyers to reconsider categories, but it's also important uh, to consider the same categories was created in different period. For instance, human rights the notion of discrimination in human rights that is based on specific categories uh, is due to the fact that that categories were used to discriminate people. But right now, when you use uh, artificial intelligence tools on big data, the categories are not that categories. Discrimination was, is not based on gender, sex, uh, religion, etc. It's based on the fact that you are a soccer mom, according to a... Uh, uh, a report adopted in 2012 in US. Soccer mommy means that you have kids that play soccer and you are more oriented to buy a certain kind of goods and to uh, use a certain kind of services. But in a few years, uh, your kids change uh, your uh, activities and you move from a category to another. So this is the risk of discrimination, but it's a completely different kind of discrimination, not based on the traditional category. So we have to reconsider also our legal approach. And moreover, take into account that this is no longer a problem in data protection. Data protection also in its historical background is a sort of enabling right. There are many other rights that uh, are uh, enabled by the use of data. And so when we talk about data protection in a broader sense, uh, I think that is important also not make a confusion because uh, right now I read in different papers a sort of confusion. So we use, uh, for instance, the principle of fairness in GDPR to put everything in the GDPR. But I think it's not correct. There are some rights that are safeguarded, that are protected in a specific manner in the international charts of fundamental rights. And we have to consider these rights in their specific context, not consider everything based on GDPR because it's not correct is another interpretation of the GDPR that also affected the effective safeguard of these rights that are better protected using traditional categories as human rights, for instance. So another point, not only moving from data protection to uh, human rights, but also considering the ethical dimension. There is a lot of debate on data ethics. There are also a lot of uh, weak contribution of data ethics because it's an IPE, and when it's an IPE, you find a lot of articles, not all the articles are so good, but it's an issue. Because we have some applications that are compliant with the law, with the local law, the Chinese credit scoring. This project founded by European Union, based on the idea that we are able to detect the emotion of the people at the border control and to understand that if they answer to the, uh, to the question the border control are correct, true or false. Uh, a part of the fact that <laughs> it's not so grounded from a scientific perspective and is funded by the European Union, uh, the problem is that all these projects uh, are based on legal ground. In the European project, the consent, informed consent, of course, and the Chinese law, 
that legitimize this kind of system. What this means, uh, considering, for instance, another case when you go to Skipo Airport and you use the body scan or something like that, there are many applications that are consistent with the law, but it doesn't mean that uh, there are no problems in terms of ethical uh, value, in terms of social value. There are some applications that impact on the manner in which we see our future as a society, as an individual. Uh, the debate that is ongoing in Toronto with regard to Google uh, Smart City project in a specific area of Toronto is an example. It's consistent with the law, but the problem is it's also consistent with the ethical and social value of the community. This community can accept to have a very uh, wide and uh, pervasive uh, forms of smart control. Uh, these are issues that should be taken into account. In this sense, I think that we have to also make a specific distinction. There are different circles. There is an inner circle that is represented by privacy and data protection, and there are differences between privacy and data protection, of course. Then there are human rights, as I mentioned before, and then there are social and ethical issues. It means that the social and ethical issues represent an add-on, representing something different. You cannot uh, risk to have an overlapping between ethical values and legal values. This is a risk from a, a regulatory perspective. Because this law selects some values and safeguards this value in the legal framework. The value of the law, of course, are grounded on ethics and social values, but are represent a selection, represent a specific core values that are safeguarded in a specific manner by the law. We cannot imagine a complete overlapping between ethics and the law. So from this perspective, ethics is something that is added to the safeguard that already protected by the, uh, provided by the law. And we cannot risk to have a confusion in this sense. Because right now, there are a lot of papers, uh, uh, guidelines uh, on data ethics that make this confusion. In which uh, principles like uh, purpose specification, uh, safeguard of privacy are represented as ethical value. Uh, this is a problem from a regulatory perspective. Because if you go to a company and say, this is an ethical value, the company say, OK, I'm not so ethical. <laughs> okay? uh, if you go to the company and say, yeah, this is not only an ethical value, but there is a regulation and there are sanctions, uh, the company think, oh, it's not so nice, but I want to be compliant. This is the reaction. So uh, it's also important not to provide misleading communication about that. Ethics is very important, but it's important to complement the regular framework to add to the regulatory, fr regulatory framework to aspects that are related to the ethical and social value in a specific community. Because different communities may have different kind of approach in data science and data use. And this aspect should be taken into account. Because it's a very important aspect. But it's something different from the legal issue. So there is an ongoing debate in this sense. There are some uh, guidelines provided by different entities, and we try to uh, summarize them. The Council of Europe uh, guidelines, I serve as a Council of Europe uh, um, um, consultant uh, for these guidelines on uh, big data that we adopted in uh, 2017. And uh, we are working now on the new guidelines on artificial intelligence. And uh, these guidelines, uh, are the first gui guidelines provided by international bodies on this field. Uh, the declaration adopted by the Conference of uh, uh, Privacy Officer and the Data Protection Authorities uh, in uh, Brussels uh, recently last uh, October, if I correctly remember, uh, and uh, the European Parliament resolution that is quite broad, and the DPS initiatives on data ethics, and many different kind of initiatives of cooperation, uh, uh, body of expert, IEEE, for instance, etc. So I focus on the main legal tools. Uh, the guidelines of big data we adopted in 2017, uh, at that time talking about ethics sounds a bit strange, but uh, we put in these guidelines, in the article 2 of the guidelines, a uh, system of impact assessment that take into account the legal issues and also the impact on the ethical and social values. This is the first system that also embed ethical and social implication in the assessment. We suggest to adopt a precautionary approach and we suggest something that is not in the GDPR and the many other data protection laws, so have a, a 
more relevant engagement of the stakeholders and have a transparency in uh, the impact assessment. In the GDPR, these elements are kind of suggestion for a large part. Uh, the uh, European Data Protection Board suggests uh, to have a better engagement and to demonstrate the reason uh, not to have in the engagement of the stakeholders and is the same also with regard to the transparency of data protection impact assessment. But unfortunately, the GDPR is not so strong in this direction. And this is strange because the data protection impact assessment in terms of general theory of risk is based on engagement is based on transparency. If you consider that the, the fundamental pillar of this model that is represented by um, environment impact assessment, environment impact assessment is a particip participatory tool and based on transparency of the results and the discussion. And we focus also on the freedom, uh, the freedom of human decision maker not to rely on the suggestion provided by big data. Because for us, big data at the level of Council Europe are mainly big data in the sense of tools to support the decision maker or to take the decision because we are not focused on the quantity of data, etc. So the freedom is very important because right now, and the same principle is also in the new guidelines on artificial intelligence. Right now, the problem is that in many cases, the human decision maker is in the front of machine that say, okay, you have the solution A that is, uh, the solution A is better than the solution C. And the, the human decision maker, 90% of case, accept this suggestion. Because if you don't accept, you take the risk to be liable with regard to your entities, your corporation or public entity. That may ask you, oh, the solution was not so good. Why you don't, uh, you didn't follow the suggestion of the machine, okay? So this, this is a risk of the limitation of self-determination. For this reason, both in, in the guidelines on big data and artificial intelligence, we suggest uh, the member parties, and uh, you remember that the Council of Europe is uh, composed by 53 members, not only European Union countries, but many countries outside of, uh, uh, of Europe. We suggest member parties to provide safeguards in order to protect the freedom of the decision maker, not to be criticized, or to be punished or have a negative consequence on the basis of the fact that they decide not to follow the machine. Because imagine the case of the doctor, okay? And the medical malpractice uh, uh, liability. Uh, you cannot say if the, if the behavior of the doctor was not consistent with the algorithm and so is liable. Uh, as a consequence, the doctor will do what the algorithm suggests and uh, based on the criticism Watson, you can understand that we have some problems in this sense. By design solution and the problem, the, the blurring distinction between sensitive and non-sensitive information. And also technical aspect, the design uh, focuses more on interface. Uh, mm, if you read, for instance, Ryan Callow, Ryan Callow suggests in an article uh, to use uh, a sort of visceral notice. So notice that are able to impact you from emotional perspective. For instance, instead of say, Oh, you, this post uh, you can share with all your friends uh, or all the world, and the option is only a ticking point. But uh, you can imagine that when you take uh, all your friends, pop up all the faces of the friends. So you say, oh, no, too much. <laughs> okay? Uh, so this is also, we have invested in this sense. We cannot continue with the traditional notice that nobody reads. Um, the risk of identification is another problem. I recently assessed the five uh, big projects uh, at uh, H2020 project on IoT, and in some projects I found the declaration in which uh, people say we use anonymous data. Okay, the problem with anonymous data is that uh, you have to demonstrate that there are anonymous data. And so you have to make an assessment of risk of identification. Because uh, if you don't focus on the risk of identification, the anonymous data are not so anonymous in some cases. And the same problem with the open data. There's a lot of emphasis on open data. Many public administrations want to be so open, but they don't care about the fact that there are many different silos of open data. Each silos can be GDPR compliant, data protection compliant, but if you merge all the silos, you can extract further information and identify person. So the open data policies should be more related, more connected with data protection issues not uh, in the sense uh, 
in which we use uh, right now, in which we have a sort of distinction. There are projects for open data and projects for data protection, but they don't uh, have a dialogue it, between the, this kind of project. The guidelines for artificial intelligence, and this version is the version October, November this year. Mm, the focus, of course, is not only data protection, but is fundamental rights, uh, consistent with the Convention 108. And the, the, it focuses on the risk, and we provide a specific guidelines to the developers and policy make. So the idea was to have a very practical approach. Unfortunately, there is a lot of debate about uh, the principles, but we need some more specific. The limitation of all these guidelines that are based on the technology. So big data, artificial intelligence, but uh, of course, uh, big data, artificial intelligence in healthcare sector, big data, artificial intelligence in defense sector, big data, artificial intelligence in transport sector are other subset of rules, a subset of values that should be taken into account. So, of course, the main limitation of these guidelines that are necessarily a bit generic. The risk assessment a focus on uh, fundamental rights, not only on data protection, and to approach a by design, uh, and to adopt a by design approach in order to focus on the risk since the beginning of the, the, the design of algorithms and focusing on the risk of decontextualization. Decontextualization of the data and of the algorithm. In many cases, we use the data as raw data. Uh, for instance, we provide uh, um, money to the schools that have the best students without taking into account that uh, the schools with the best students are also, re the that's performance of the schools are also related with the social economical context. And so if you don't care about the social economical context, so your evaluation, can, your assessment can be wrong. Or decontextualization of the algorithm, in the case in which you use an algorithm that was created for a specific topic and in another field. That may work, but may not. You have to assess this kind of risk. Um, the role of independent committee of experts, because in many cases algorithms are created by computer scientists. But computer scientists, we cannot ask computer scientists to become experts of law, expert of sociology, expert of ethics, and so on. So we need to have bodies that support the developers, providing them guidance about the impact of the decision of their tools. Moreover, when these tools are used for predicting crime, for smart cities, for situations that have a high impact on society. And to do that, we have to engage people. We have a more participatory approach. Also because participation is important to figure out the risk. Through participation, the people that are potentially affected are the best per person in many cases to provide information about the risk. Because if you stay in a room of experts, in many cases you are not an effective real picture of the world outside. And uh, another point is uh, the idea that uh, there is a migration towards artificial intelligence, but we don't need necessarily to migrate everything. So we have also to give the user to have the option of the stupid fridge, not only the smart fridge. This is another important aspect. The technology should not be compulsory. You are not to adopt necessary a technology or another. Um, and the knowledge of the fact that there is a technology, the knowledge that the fact that there is a data pro uh, artificial intelligence behind. And for the policy maker, we suggest to translate uh, transparency, prior assessment, all this stuff in the procurement, in the public procurement, and moreover, to invest in a dialogue between the different supervisor authorities, because uh, when we talk about the impact on human rights, uh, there is not only data protection authorities, there are also other independent authorities in many cases that have voice. And uh, moreover, the idea of uh, cooperation and uh, also, oh, there was another point, uh, the, the point on algorithm vigilance. So the idea that the algorithm is not, is not like a car. When you create a car, if you, the project is good in terms of safety, the car is good. The problem is uh, that when we create an algorithm, and it's a machine learning algorithm, the algorithm can change over the time. And uh, if you have not a system of vigilance, like uh, the vigilance that, for instance, we have in the pharma sector, 
uh, it's difficult to realize that this change may negatively affect the individuals or society. The declaration of uh, the data protection authorities in many parts overlaps the guidelines of the Council of Europe also because in many cases there are the same entities involved. They focus on trust, uh, they focus on ethics and human rights, they focus on collective impact, accountability and vigilance like mentioned before, transparency and privacy and ethics by design and uh, risk of bias. Uh, one point, transparency, is there is a lot of debate on transparency algorithm. I want to only say that it's not so easy to achieve transparency algorithm. And, uh, and moreover, our experience with notice and consent also suggests that transparency per se is not necessarily the best answer to this kind of problem. EDPS initiatives, the EDPS initiatives is represented by the group of uh, experts in ethics that uh, was created by the EDPS. In uh, this initiative, it's interesting because uh, it's more focused on ethics, but also for this reason, there is a sort of overlapping between the legal and the ethical aspects. Uh, in this sense, uh, it's an important tool, but it's also the first step towards a broader discussion in this sector. And uh, it's important when we start discussion to Take into, into our mind what I mentioned before, the idea that ethics and law are not exactly the same, and what is already in the law should not be recreated as an ethical value. These are the five directions, very broad principle provided by the EDPS in its work. Corporate initiative, last point. There are many different initiatives from the corporate side. The main problem is that in many cases there is a confusion between ethical and legal value. That there are some cases in which ethics is used as a market value. Um, that uh, there are important experiences also in ethical committees, but uh, there is not a practice in terms of independence, transparency, and so on. So there are big corporations that say, okay, we have a, an ethical committee, but we don't share the information about the member of the committee. And this is a, a bit critical. And uh, the risk is also the risk of the values that corporate put in these ethical tools because, of course, they are affected by the context, uh, also the corporation. So this is the whole uh, uh, solution that we are trying to figure out uh, to address the challenges represented by the data protection and broadly that intensive system that use personal information to predict the behavior of individuals and society in the context of artificial intelligence and big data application. Thanks a lot. So do we have any uh, questions for Alessandro? Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about impact assessment. So our it is just being introduced in the most member states. And uh, what do you think are, can uh, uh, um, more serious involvement of data subjects and regulators, uh, data protection authorities into carrying out the uh, impact assessments help also with the ethical question? Because at the moment, well, the GDPR does not state exactly that in any case you shall consult data subjects and regulatory authorities, and many companies say, no, we are subject to commercial secrets, we're not going to share them. And the next question may be also related to the fact, can also maybe the publishing of impact assessments, of course, subject to the limitations related to commercial secrets, help also achieve a goal of being more ethical and more compliant with the data protection rules? Yeah. I think that's... Uh the GDPR Article 35 of impact assessment have uh, inside many potential outcomes in the future. Because the GDPR is not only focused on data protection, there is a lot of references to human rights in general, fundamental freedoms, and so on. And the data protection impact assessment can be the tool that can serve for this purpose. For this reason, for instance, we are working and, and we publish next year a book on uh, impact assessment focused on human rights in the use of data intensive uh, 
uh, tools. But right now, unfortunately, the data protection impact assessment tools are not in this direction because they are traditionally based on the previous models. And so you s find a list of uh, 40 questions, and only one is uh, there are also some impacts on the ethical and social consequences of the use of data. And so this is not the manner to address the challenge. Also because uh, when we talk about ethical and social um, consequences, you have to provide to data controller tools to understand the problem. Because in many cases, they don't realize the problem. And so I think that uh, in the GDPR, in the data protection impact assessment, there, is, uh, there are some elements that are useful to address these issues, but we have invested more on that. And also, open GDPR towards other fields like human rights and not focusing on data protection per se. So I'm more oriented also in my last article and in the book on the human rights impact assessment that embed also ethical and social values, not only data protection. There is also a risk to this uh, extensive interpretation of the idea of data protection. And the second question was about um, the, 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 the fact that uh, is public available the data protection impact assessment, that was suggested uh, by the guidelines of Council of Europe and also by legal scholars. This is possible to have, uh, for instance, a part of the, the impact assessment um, public available. Um, in the, the, the guidance of the Council of Europe, the, the idea was that if the part of the impact assessment are available, you can understand the risk. And if you can understand the risk, you can take the decision. So the example that I, I provided during the discussion in the Council of Europe and also in the conference is um, the alcohol bottle. In the alcohol bottle, when you, you buy an alcohol bottle, you don't read the description, okay? And the description is the notice in notice and consent data protection system. What you read? You read the fact that there is a risk, the fire, that the symbol that represents the fire. And this is the risk. So this, this is the approach. People are not so interested in the manner in which you process the data, but are interested in the impact, in the risk. Focusing more on the risk, providing more information about the risk, we can also create a better environment in terms of awareness and self-determination with regard to data processing. Thank you. Any more questions? No? All right. Well, thank you, Alessandro. Thank you very much. Thank you.